one. Hey, welcome back to another Dispatch from Holly McKay. We're going back to Afghanistan today to check on how things are for women in Afghanistan a year after the Taliban have taken over. Holly, uh, give us a picture of what's going on. Well, of course, the focus really in the international media has been on girls' education and the fact that in most provinces, the Taliban still isn't allowing a secondary education for girls in public schools. And so, of course, that is a really big issue. Um, but I wanted to look a little bit beyond that. Um, and so sort of being on the ground, I think it gave me definitely a different sense of, of what life was like for women and of course, it's very individual. I mean, for a lot of women in rural areas, their lives haven't necessarily changed so much. And the uncomfortable reality with that is that their lives may even be better, you know, now because they perhaps were in a Taliban strong village. Um, so they really didn't benefit necessarily from the programs that the US backed government and other foreign NGOs and things brought in. Um, and their lives would be better in the sense that there isn't sort of that same scale of war. There isn't sort of the constant bombing and and fear of air raids and other things. So, um, you know, and, and they may have not gone to school anyway. So there certainly is that. Um, we tend to look at things often just from a very much the sort of city lens, the Kabul lens, and, and that is certainly very important, but it's not indicative of women across Afghanistan. However, for a, for a lot of women, um, not only are they sort of facing not being able to go to school, um, but there is still a lot of restrictions in terms of university, what they have to wear, the hours that they have to go, um, certainly opportunities just from an economic point of view have definitely lowered things like music and art and sort of all these other vocations that were really brought in for women over the past 20 years have definitely fallen to the wayside. So there are is a lot that I think women have lost. Um, what I found to be really interesting when I would talk to Taliban in government, um, they would all tell me that they generally leave the private sector alone, that if women were working in the private sector, they've gone back to those jobs if those jobs still exist. Um, but in government, of course, there are no women working in government except for very low level roles like security checks. That's really the only place that I saw um, women and they would be in sort of a private little room. And um, you know, while the men would go and get uh, patted down, I would go into a sort of a small room and, and the women would check my bag and pat me down there. That was really the only role that I saw women in terms of government. Um, the Taliban people told me that women that had jobs previously in the last government are still receiving their salaries, but now they are required to basically, you know, be home and serve their children and serve their husband. Um, while still receiving money, they aren't um, actually able to come to work. So that sort of, I guess, I, I don't necessarily sort of see that changing with the Taliban, despite the overtures that they're constantly giving about, we respect women, we want full rights for women, um, but they sort of see that as under the umbrella of Islam that they see it and with their cultural tradition so that, um, you know, full rights can certainly be debated. Mm, well, it's certainly not the Western definition of what full rights looks looks like. So socially, you, you had a little bit in your report that... Um, you know, you you really only see women in what family sections and and those types of uh, special areas in society at this point, as opposed to being able to go out on their I mean, own. That, you know, to be fair, that really was always the case in Afghanistan, um, and is in a lot of those very sort of conservative uh, Muslim countries. There are in a lot of cafes, you know, there is a family section, which is where the women and the children are. And of course, their husbands and, and you know, brothers and things can join them there. But for men that simply just want to be alone, there's, you know, a dedicated sort of area for them. So that hasn't changed necessarily in terms of the structure. But I was a little bit heartened, I guess, to see that women were still going out, girls were still going out and you know, a couple of times I would see even groups of young men and, and women um, that, you know, like weren't necessarily married, but they were sort of going out and smoking hookah. And so, you know, there were these sort of what I would consider to be little acts of rebellion um, going on. And, and Kabul still had a nightlife, you know, restaurants were still open, um, you know, may not have the blasting music and the TV screens and things like that that used to exist. But I think young Afghans and, and both men and women are, are still looking for that 
you know, looking for that social aspect. And um, of course, I've also heard situations where in one particular cafe I tried to go into and, and you know, they said as a woman, I, I couldn't smoke kuka, which is what uh, myself and, and my fixer Naweed and I had gone out to do. And I, he told me that, you know, several months earlier um, in this particular cafe that a group of young uh, boys and girls had gone out and, um, you know, somebody reported them to the Taliban and the Taliban sort of came and it turned into um, a, a very big event, if you will, and that these sort of girls and, and boys were forced to marry each other because just based on the fact that they had gone out together that night um, and that was considered to be, you know, very much against the, uh, you know, how the Taliban sees customs for Afghans. So there are certainly these... Uh, things that do happen um but at the same time women are still very you know in Kabul at least still very vocal i mean they have these sort of whatsapp and tele telegram groups and they decide where they're going to go and protest and and what issue they're going to go and protest that particular week and and they get together and they you know know within 10 minutes that it's going to be a a hail of gunfire and that it's going to be dispersed but they still go out to do that because that is their way of of um, i guess keeping on the forefront and and that refusal to just be relegated to a dank basement the way they were in the 90s under the previous taliban rule um so it is you know these small i guess examples of of um continuing to to sort of put their face out there and and you definitely you know, Afghan women are, are very strong and you, you certainly still see that. Yeah. So on the last question, in terms of general society in, in the cities, the urban areas, which is where um, very clearly these these lingering differences in values are, what was your sense the last time you were there as to how urban life in Afghanistan is for the majority of women at this point? I think it's a, you know, obviously a lot of the freedoms that they were perhaps used to previously, um, just in, in terms of artistic pursuits or school or um, they definitely uh, sort of have fallen away. Um, but at the same time, it, it's not fair to necessarily say that, you know, Afghanistan was completely different before because it's not, um, you know, it always is a sort of a, a, a much more conservative society. I certainly never saw a woman without a hijab on. Um, but in terms of dress, I mean, I still wear what I always wore in Afghanistan, which is, you know, a very sort of long dress and pants and um, a headscarf. Uh, the burqa is, whilst it's sort of, um, you know, quote unquote mandate, it's certainly not enforced as it is right now. It's recommended for, for girls and to wear that, but it's not enforced. So you certainly still see a lot of uh, girls and women uh, just wearing a hijab, which was always the case in Afghanistan. But I think from an economic perspective, that is where there really is a big struggle. Um, just for all Afghans, really. And of course, you know, as we know, and as somebody that's covered war for a long time, it, it really is always women that seem to be hit the hardest by these economic struggles. I mean, it seems to impact every facet of their life, whether how much food they're able to put on the table, how much they can care for their child. Um, and so that is the sort of the really challenging part. Um, and I think the economic situation is only worsened by the fact that a lot of women either out of self-censorship or because their jobs don't exist anymore or because so many of the foreigners left the country last year um, that you sort of cut this uh, big chunk of the workforce out, um, you know, where women are, are staying at home, whereas they may have gone out previously to do different jobs or go to university to pursue different vacations. So um, a lot of it is enforced and also a lot of it is uh, a choice by fear or, or just by circumstance as well. Um, but it was... Uh, there was one area which I'm told has not sort of been affected um, by the, the sort of the Taliban's new rules, and that's the healthcare sector, um, which is at least sort of uh, sort of nice to to kind of hear. Um, the healthcare sector in Afghanistan was always a big struggle, um, despite all the money that was really poured into it. Um, a lot of that went to private pockets, to corruption. It never really went where it was supposed to go. So the healthcare system um, really was terrible, terrible for women giving birth, terrible for children. And, um, and we sort of did see that crumple even more when um, the U.S. froze the funds and when all the NGOs and things left after the Taliban took over. Um, but in terms of women employment um, and in terms of of being able to sort of not um, 
impact that too much. The Taliban, from what I'm told by the doctors in these places, have basically left the healthcare sector alone for now. Um, but it, it still is sort of reliant upon um, international NGOs like the ICRC, like emergency, to sort of continue to fund them and to to ensure that Afghans who are remaining in the country get uh, the best quality of care possible. Oh, there you go. Well, um, well, at least there's one area. Um, and maybe over time, other areas as well, but uh, kind of a dour situation right now. Well, thanks for the update on that one, Holly. It's, um, you know, a year in. They're not the greatest stories in the world, but at least there's somebody keeping track of them. And thank you for that. Thank you. I'll talk to you again soon.